Good morning, everyone. Well, you're all very welcome to Followers of the Way uh, this morning on this, the 9th of October, 2022. As you may know, Linda is not with us this morning. She and her husband are in Cambridge, where he is being honoured with a fest shrift. Hope I said that in the right way. This is a collection of essays by his peers in recognition of his scholarly accomplishments. So our congratulations go to him. And I know that Linda's prayers are with us this morning. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are continuing in our series in Mark's Gospel, God's Rescue Plan Revealed. This morning, Philip is going to bring us the message, which is entitled Moving in Power. The Apostle Paul knew God's power in his life and ministry. But he also experienced weakness. In 2 Corinthians 12, he speaks of his thorn in the flesh, which he pleaded with God to remove. God did not remove it. And instead, he heard God say, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. The power of God is supremely displayed in the weakness of Christ on the cross and the might of his resurrection from the tomb. We too can know that power. Writing to the Ephesians, Paul said, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Ephesians 1, 18 to 20. This morning, as we worship our suffering servant king, let us all be aware of that power that is available to us. Let us pray. O God, our Father, in the name of Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit, we bring before you our worship and praise and thanksgiving. You have made each of us in your own image and given us gifts and abilities to use in service. So we offer these back to you in gratitude of your grace. Take our lips that we may speak to others of you. Take our tongues that we may sing your sweet praise. Take our hands that we may be busy serving you. Take our feet that we may go where you lead. Take ourselves, our whole being, body, mind, soul and spirit, that we may dedicate our whole lives to you as a living sacrifice. May this time of corporate worship be but a small reflection of our whole lives given in worship before you, our mighty, powerful God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. One of the weapons in the Christian's armor is praise. And we're going to ask Anthony now to lead us in a time of praise. Thank you, Anthony. Good morning, everyone. I think I think when I praise, I think that the evil spirits just run away. 
<laughs> I love the way Steve says the uh, par. <laughs> I used to work as an English teacher in an international school in London, and uh, my my director was also from Northern Ireland. And um, obviously, I'm from North Yorkshire, and I say power. So that's like two syllables, whereas Steve says it with just one syllable. Pam, who was here over in Liverpool, she would probably say power. I don't know. <laughs> two syllables again. And I'd just pity all the students that used to come from all over the world. <laughs> and they would hear all these different teachers, like, speak with different accents and think, oh, which, 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 which one do I use? But I think um, the beauty of... Um, being in the body of Christ is no matter what our accent or where we come from, what we look like, we're all united. We're all one in him because he unites everyone, doesn't he? Like Paul said, there's no slave or free man, no Jew or Gentile. In Christ, we're all one. Right. <clears throat> Let's start singing. I think that's what I'm here for. <clears throat> this is an old classic, which I love. Immortal, invisible, love of God only wise, enlightened, accessing, no hid from our eyes, most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty victory. My great name we pray. Unresting, unhasting, unsilent as life, nor wanting, nor wasting, thou rulest in might. Thy justice like mountains, I saw. Thank you. 
This is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all my heart I worship you, all I have within I give. I give you my heart, I give you my soul, I live for you alone, every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake, Lord have your way. is my desire to honor you lord with all my heart i worship you all i have within me i give you Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul, I live for you alone, every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake, Lord, have your way in me, Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul, I live for time away Lord have your way in me thanks Anthony for that and uh, <laughs> I'm always aware of saying that word uh before English people or people from the rest of the UK. Uh, a few years ago at Magnets, our children's work that we do out here, uh, one of the parents uh, of the children was helping us. She was from Wales and I was talking, I think it was something to do with the Holy Spirit's power. And afterwards she came up and asked me, what's power? <laughs> <laughs> so I had to enlighten her. <laughs> But thank you for that. So no matter what, as you say, what accent we have, it's the same power, power uh, that's available to us all. But that power that we receive, it helps us to overcome temptation and sin. But the way to access that power is through repentance and confession. We're going now to make our confession before God corporately as we say words together, which will come on to the screen. But we also do it individually. We as individuals know the sins that are in our hearts and what we need to confess. So if we could have the words up on the screen, but before we say these together, of course, uh, staying muted, Let's spend a few moments in silence, asking God through his Holy Spirit to search our hearts, 
and to reveal to us those things we need to confess. And so we say together, Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed, through neg negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, by what we have done and by what we have failed to do. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Having confessed our sins, we hear God's assurance of his forgiveness. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on each and every one of us. Pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and keep us in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We read in Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Liz is going to bring us our Bible reading this morning. Thank you, Liz. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and, and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly I, I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death, before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. Thank you, Liz. So uh, just before Philip comes and uh, preaches, us, uh, preaches to us about moving in power, let me just pray for him. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, which is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And Lord, we pray for your servant Philip now as he opens that word to us. Give us ears to hear, minds to think, and wills to obey. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Philip, over to you. Thank you so much, 
So into our passage for today, and as Steve has already told us, the theme is moving in power. Christianity is a religion of power. The followers of Jesus Christ are not helpless victims at the mercy of a world under the control of Satan and his fallen angels. We are instead mighty warriors in the army of God. We're kings and priests in the heavenly kingdom. And we have the corresponding authority to take on the enemy and to win. We are soldiers of Christ, equipped with spiritual weapons of warfare that are perfectly crafted to handle whatever challenges and threats we might face. As the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Later, Paul wrote to encourage the believers in Ephesus, saying, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. That wasn't a pep talk of the kind that the world might give. It wasn't based on a vague hope or some man-made theology. It was a statement about the reality of the Christian life. Following his crucifixion, Jesus promise to his followers was, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. That was a promise that held good, not just in the first century AD, but right here and now. It's a promise for us. We will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on us. As Paul emphasized to his friend Timothy, God didn't give us a spirit of fear but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-control. Writing to another of the embattled early Christian communities, Paul was careful to remind them, the gospel came to you, not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. And the Apostle Peter wrote in similar terms of how God's divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. What we have to ask ourselves in the light of all that is, if we've been given a spirit of power, and if we've been given all we need for life and godliness, why do so few of us seem to move in power? Why do the vast majority of people in our nation regard the church as lacking in power? And how can we tap more fully into this power that we've been given and use it as the Lord intends in these last days? If we're going to come at those questions right, we need to get to grips with three things. The nature of the power, that is the difference between Holy Spirit power and any other kind the source of the power, and how to walk in the way of the power. That's what we're going to examine today, the nature of divine power, the source of divine power, and the way of divine power. We humans generally have a weakness for some combination of money, sex, or power. Those are the things that habitually trip us up. And scripture tells us what human beings' idea of power looks like. The very first time that word power appears in the Bible is when Laban confronts his nephew Jacob, who's deceived him. It's a really threatening encounter. And Laban growls, I have the power to harm you. In our natural state, that's what we tend to use power for, 
to dominate, to overrule, to compel, to hurt, to abuse. That's our fallen nature talking, still in bondage to sin and beholden to the God of this world, who is Satan. That's what mankind's idea of power looks like. We know what Satan's version of power looks like because the Bible tells us about that too. Its ultimate objective is to steal and kill and destroy, and it operates through mechanisms like incitement, accusation, temptation, deception, rebellion, enslavement, lawlessness, and the counterfeiting of what's good. Satan's idea of power is grasping after what is rightfully God's, behaving with utter selfishness and crushing anyone who gets in his way. Imagine doing the exact opposite of what the Ten Commandments say, and you get the general idea. The Christian rejects man's version of power and rejects Satan's version of power. Instead, he seeks God's version of power. That power is rooted in suffering, self-denial, and dying to the things of this world. And so we read in verse 31 of Mark 8, how Jesus began to teach the disciples that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. Paul wrote to the church in Philippi of how he wanted to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his suffering, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection of the dead. That was Paul's heartfelt personal desire, but Jesus made it clear that that is also the way for all believers. Look at verses 34 and 35 of our scripture passage today. Then he, that's Jesus, called the crowd to him along with the disciples and said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. The power released through suffering, death and resurrection is power to save and to heal. Power to set free from the chains other people put on us and to gain release from bondage to demonic forces. It's power to proclaim a new and better way of living, becoming reconciled to God, to others, even to ourselves, eventually to see all things reconciled. It's power to walk in the truth and the light rather than in lies and darkness. It's power to see happen in our own time and place all those things we read about in the Gospels and the Book of Acts. It's power to see the servants of Almighty God do those greater works that Jesus spoke about. That's the nature of this divine power that God has set in us. It's power that needs to be used God's way, not man's. In Acts chapter 8, we read of how a sorcerer called Simon offered the apostles money in return for Holy Spirit power. Peter answered, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this mystery because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. So to access divine power, 
we need to have not just the right methods, but also the right heart. And of course, we need to look in the right place. As Jesus went about his earthly ministry, he demonstrated wonder-working power at every turn. And yet still, many were unsure where his power came from and uncertain about his identity. Verses 27 and 28 of Mark chapter 8 tell us that Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. Now, on one level, we can understand that kind of confusion, at least in the first few months after Jesus burst on the scene. Uh, Mark chapter 1 tells us that after John the Baptist was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. And of course, every age has charlatans or deluded people who say that they're heaven sent when they're not. About a hundred years after Jesus was crucified, a man called Simon Bar Kochba inspired a Jewish revolt against God by claiming to be the Messiah. And many of the religious establishment of his day accepted that claim. Highly ironic, given that most of that same elite rejected Jesus. So there may perhaps have been some room for doubt at the very start, but Jesus soon removed that cause for doubt. He was careful to act in such a way that anyone who paid close attention to what they saw and heard could no longer have any reasonable doubt in their minds. His miracles paralleled and surpassed what God had done through the spiritual giants of the Old Covenant. When Moses had led Israel through its desert wandering, manna was provided to the people during that time. God called it bread from heaven. And so Jesus, born in Bethlehem, which means the place of bread, described himself as being the bread that came down from heaven. And just as Elijah saw God raise the widow of Zarephath's son from the dead, so Jesus raised people from the dead. Jairus' daughter, the widow of Nain's son, Lazarus, raise them back to life. Just as Elijah had seen a widow and her son fed miraculously from meager portions of oil and flour, so Jesus fed thousands with only a few loaves and fish. In these and many other ways, he showed himself to be a greater Moses and a greater Elijah. Moses was the great mediator of the old covenant. And Jesus is the great mediator of the new covenant. Elijah was the archetype of the great prophets of old, but Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. And of course, into the bargain, Jesus claimed extraordinary things. He said, one greater than the prophet Jonah is here, one greater than that proverbially wise king Solomon is here, and one greater than the temple is here. He's greater than the greatest prophet. He's greater than the greatest earthly king. And he is greater than the most complete religious system. Almost, almost all of those events I've just been speaking about, the raising of a dead girl, the feeding of a multitude, what Jesus said about being greater than what had gone before, and into the bargain, the calming the storm, the casting out demons, all of those things had taken place by the time of the episode that we're looking at in our Bible reading from today. The disciples saw and heard these things later on. They attested that they were eyewitnesses to this extraordinary glory that God had disclosed through the life and ministry of Christ. So the disciples weren't short of evidence. In fact, when Nathaniel was very first called by Jesus to become a disciple, he'd said, Rabbi, you're the son of God, you're the king of Israel. And now, when Jesus asked his disciples the question, 
What about you? Who do you say I am? Peter answered, You're the Christ. You're the Messiah. Peter saw that Jesus is our source of divine power. This is where all the evidence points. But evidence alone won't get us to the place of acknowledging it. Matthew's gospel tells us that Jesus' response to that extraordinary declaration of faith from Peter was to say, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but my, by my Father. We can't do it without God's enabling. But the Lord says, you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. If you haven't already done it, seek Jesus with all your heart today. He's the source of divine power and much, much, much more besides. Well, we've talked about the nature of divine power and the source of divine power. So next we need to reflect on the way of divine power. There's order in the kingdom of heaven, which means there's a right way to use divine power and a wrong way. In Luke's gospel, chapter four, we read about how the devil tried to get Jesus to use divine power the wrong way. When he led Jesus up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of this world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor, for it's been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want. So if you worship me, it will all be yours. Peter recognized Jesus as the source of divine power in one breath, then objected loudly when Jesus explained that the way of power had to lead through a path of suffering, rejection, and death. Verse 32 and 33 of Mark 8, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Now that's a very well-known exchange. First, Peter rebuking Jesus, before Jesus then rebukes Peter. The hinge on which that narrative shifts from Peter's rebuke to Jesus' rebuke is the phrase, when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples. Jesus turned from the voice of this world, which is under the control of the evil, to look at the people who were to be his messengers to the uttermost ends of the earth. In doing so, he recalled the task for which he had come, not to be served, but to serve, to seek and save the lost, to give his life as a ransom for many, and so that we might have life and have it to the full. From a place of then focusing on his divine mission, he was able to resist another of Satan's attempts to derail and sidetrack God's rescue plan for fallen humanity. And having done that, Jesus then spoke a universal message, delivered not just to his disciples, but also to the crowd that had gathered around. We see it in verses 36 and 33 to 38 of Mark 8. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for it? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man, will be ashamed of him when he comes in his father's glory with the holy angels. And here we see the way of power laid bare. I'm going to sum it up in 10 words beginning with the letter R. Two groups of three, one group of four. Here's the first group of three. Reflect, 
reassess, recalibrate. Reflect, reassess, recalibrate. Reflect on the message the world pumps at us day by day and hour by hour. Reassess how we respond to it, seeking to have in mind the things of God, not the things of God. And recalibrate. To bring our thinking and acting into line with God's ways. We will almost certainly face rejection, but this is the first necessary step to moving in power. The second group of people remember, recognize, resist. Remember, recognize, resist. Remember our call, as Paul wrote to the Corinthians is to be Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. Recognise that we can't leave it up to someone else to do that job for us. And resist the devil, because when we do that, he will flee from us. Peter wrote, resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of suffering. If, we might say when, suffering comes, we have to face it as mature adults, not little babies. The truth is, it goes with the territory. It's part of the way of pain. And now, the third group, rebuke, renounce, rededicate, resolve. Rebuke, renounce, rededicate, resolve. Rebuke the voices that try to speak Satan's lies into our lives, even if they come from people we love and trust. Renounce the things of this world and their claims to authority and splendor. Rededicate ourselves to God's service and resolve to use our weapons of warfare as their designs for this is the path towards dying to self, being re reborn into new life with the Lord, and moving in his power. Power and authority go hand in hand. Our power as believers isn't our own, it's a delegated one. There's power in the name of Jesus, and we have power of attorney to use this name. It's the name above every name, at which every knee in heaven and on earth must bow. Demons are compelled to submit to this name. In Acts chapter 4, we read of how Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, told the Jewish ruling council, the Sanhedrin, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Mark chapter 9, verse 1, the last sentence of our reading today. Jesus said to the disciples and to the crowd, I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. That promise was fulfilled at the first Pentecost. We are Pentecost people. We're a Holy Spirit people. We're a people of power. There is a greater power with us than with our enemy. It's time to believe it. It's time to act on it. It's time to move in power. Let it be so. Amen. Amen, indeed. Thank you, uh, Philip. And uh, thank you for that message, even though there's a, a little bit of struggle, uh, you know, getting uh, your voice heard. But thank you for persevering and giving us that very timely message. And as he said, in order for us to move in power, we need to know the source of that power. And of course, we know that source comes from the Lord. Each week. We make a declaration together of our faith using familiar words. 
This is not vain repetition. Vain repetition means empty or meaningless. It would only become vain repetition if we said these words without thinking about them or meaning them. What I believe we are doing, however, is declaring to each other, to the world, and indeed to the principalities and powers, where our power comes from. It comes from the one God who has revealed himself in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So as we remain muted, let us make our declaration of faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This is a summary of our faith, the faith in that one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, from whom comes our power. We're going to pray to this God now as Hilary leads us in our prayers of intercessions. Thank you, Hilary. Oh, Lord God, King of the universe, creator of heaven and earth, we worship you. Might, majesty, dominion, and power are yours forever and ever. You are worthy of all honor and praise, for you are a holy God. And we thank you for being a loving and merciful and faithful Father. You have said in your word, anything we ask in Jesus' name, in other words, according to his will, you will do for us. So we seek to know your will and your ways so that we might walk according to your will and be pleasing to you. So we bring our petitions before you in confidence that you hear us. We now pray for our nation. We ask you to please give Liz Truss wisdom and courage as she seeks to lead our nation. Please help her and her advisors to find a solution to the Northern Ireland Protocol. Please give her and her Home Secretary the strength to stand against Stonewall's insidious influence in our police force and schools. We thank you for her love of Israel, and we ask that her desire to move the embassy to Jerusalem will be accomplished. According to your will, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Please give stability to Israel's government and may the members of the Knesset seek your will for the nation. We pray for the protection for members of the IDF as they face danger daily. We pray that many more Jewish people will find Yeshua as their Messiah. Please bless and empower those who are working amongst them to that end. We pray for persecuted Christians, especially those in Nigeria, where more Christians have been killed for their faith by Islamist terrorists in the last year than in the entire Middle East. Please provide for the families of those who've been killed. Please comfort, strengthen, encourage, and protect those who remain in these areas. And we pray for those who suffer famine. Heavenly Father, 
our creator and provider, in your mercy and compassion, please provide for the needs of our brothers and sisters and all who are hungry in East Africa as their crops have failed. We thank you that you have, we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit. We thank you that he will lead us into all truth. We thank you that you have delegated power and authority to us in your name that enables us to be overcomers. We thank you for your perfect peace that passes all understanding and that doesn't depend on our circumstances, but on your presence with us. We thank you for the joy that we have in your presence. We pray that you will use us to bring others into that knowledge of the truth, that Jesus is the only way, the truth and the life, and that in him is fullness of joy. We ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus, our Saviour and Lord. Amen. Thank you, Hilary, for leading us in those prayers. And now, as normal, we're going to have an opportunity to pray for those on our hearts who need God's healing touch. And I will say the words that are on the screen. And then when the appropriate time comes, if you want to unmute yourself and uh, speak out names or situations that you want to bring before God Almighty. We bring to the Lord the sick and suffering. Those who are heavy laden those who mourn and grieve, those who are weary, tired and anxious. Their needs do not go unnoticed by our God. May the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ bless and restore all those troubled in body, mind or spirit, those whom we now name before him. And so in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the power of the Spirit, may God in his perfect compassion restore them and speedily send them complete healing of soul and body. Let healing come speedily. And let us all say, Amen. 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 And as we conclude this time of prayer, we join together in the words which Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Anthony, if you could lead us once more in praise. There's a lovely old hymn I always associate with the Salvation Army, those um, courageous Christians in Victorian Britain who used to go into the, the worst areas of, of London and other big cities and bring the light and the hope of, uh, of the kingdom and of our Lord. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead, till every foe is vanquished, and Christ is Lord indeed. Stand up, stand up for 
Jesus, the trumpet call obey, of to the mighty conflict in this his glorious day. He that a brave now serve him against a numbered foes, let courage rise with day. Stand up for Jesus, the strife will not be long. This day the noise of battle, the next the victor's song. To him who overcome, a crown of life shall be. He with the King of glory shall reign eternal. Thank you, Anthony. And um, as you talk about the Salvation Army, you think almost of marching there, uh, marching in power. So thank you for that. So that's coming to the end of our service. So just the blessing and the dismissal. Uh, the blessing is from uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.